five, four, three, two, and one. This is episode 24 of the Art of Move podcast. My name is Anthony Manuel. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. William Raybar. Uh, we are doing the Art of Move where we try to find the grand unified theory of how the human body is supposed to move the correct biomechanics for the body in general. And, uh, you know, on episode 24, we're going to be kind of exploring a few different angles. We have uh, a few interesting Instagram posts that sparked some debate. Uh, and it kind of gets on the the level of like moralism and philosophy. I actually think we're going to kind of explore that a little bit. We're going to explore um, some claims that Goda made that uh, that not everyone can can maybe even wrap their head around, let alone accept wholeheartedly because they 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 seem like very very extreme claims. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about some of the esoteric language that they use, things like vortex math. And, uh, and, you know, this idea that you can work within this mathematical model so precisely that and, and, and make your movement so efficient that you don't have to fire your muscles to propel yourself forward, essentially, to, to this transference of energy, creating such efficient movement that you don't have to fire your muscles straight ahead, which is a, a claim that uh, one of the, the well, the go to founder, Coach Gill made, we have the video queued up to, uh, to kind of explore that. Uh, we're going to also talk about the idea of using slow motion video and observation as a way to critically assess movement and to discover, uh, you know, proper biomechanics, because I think that's been one of the biggest things that people have criticized about the go to movement system, which we're huge fans of. We're not, neither of us are actual go to coaches. We're just, you know, two guys that are trying to find the truth about movement and find the optimal way to move as human beings and go to principles you know, very, very much aligned with what makes sense to us biomechanically, physiologically, everything. We haven't found any good arguments against it. So we're just saying, hey, like, let's run with this. And we've investigated a lot, right? As as two people are kind of on the outside of the, uh, I'd say, organization of GOTA, we're two guys who love GOTA. And we we implement their principles into our training practices a lot. And uh, and specifically, we're going to be exploring some of the, some of the claims and and exploring the idea of you know can, is slow motion video and observation a valid way to assess biomechanics we think it is and we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit more so right off the get-go will what's uh what's kind of caught your attention in the movement world recently oh there's so much i mean uh the controversy you sent me yesterday i'm, I'm pretty sure it was coach zach deck on instagram yeah. saying that uh what was the what was the he, quote again so it's he said please stop posting photos of athletes getting injured as a means to boost engagement right and and you know in in the comments he said he wasn't directly addressing go to coaches he said there are coaches in general athletic coaches that are you know posting these photos or or you know videos of athletes who are getting injured and saying that they could have prevented this injury if they had just followed my method and it's this like almost shocking uh strategy on social media to boost your engagement and he, he he considered it like rather unethical to be posting people athletes in their most vulnerable moments where they're getting injured on on field uh and you get a bunch of go to coaches in the comments saying hey it's for educational purposes we're demonstrating the patterns uh it is validating our methods because it's being consistent with the the patterns that we identified as causing injury so, you know, like you should be able to to showcase this stuff. And he he argued, you know, it's not necessarily that it's not educational, but you shouldn't be you shouldn't be showing these athletes when they're when they're messing themselves up so bad. And so I was kind of curious, you know, what, what's what's your take on that? Do you have the post? Yeah, I do. Chance? I will. Uh, okay. I will um, share my screen well, and we'll pull it up. If if he was talking about Goda, I'm not 100% sure he was because I actually didn't read the comments. But if he was talking about Goda in in this, then um, I would say he's completely off on this because that is the way to validate their method. They say this is how uh, injury happens, and it's very 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 specific where you need to watch it on slow motion. So there's no other way to do it. Um, traditionally, it would be done through uh, you know research and papers. But it's just not the best way to do it. The best way to do it would be to show it a thousand times over. And Goda makes a specific claim. They say, find a ACL or Achilles injury with an inside ankle bone high. And I've still yet to see a single practitioner 
or uh, you know, Instagram person that dislikes Goda, there's a lot of them. I've yet to see one uh, post something. So yeah. to counter this. So please send an inside ankle bone high injury of the Achilles and of the ACL or, or MCL. Okay, so uh, I haven't found one yet. Maybe there are some out there. Uh, you'll definitely find some ankle injuries, some turnovers from an inside mm -hmm. ankle bone high. I don't, <clears throat> yeah, excuse me, I don't doubt that. But uh, I don't think you'll find a inside ankle bone high or many of them anyway. I've yet to see one again. Of uh, sure, like in a, like in an actual Achilles tear or, or or a major knee injury, right? Like these big knee blowouts, all of these things, these uh, these you know the woda patterns, the worst of all time action patterns that go to defines are consistent with every slow motion video of all these athletes getting injured, right? So, you know, um, uh, Delelo method. He, he's a he's a big go to guy, and he says it's for educational purposes, right? And and basically, again, Zach is not necessarily criticizing the fact that there are athletes who are getting injured who you can observe and learn from, but just posting it on social media isn't the place, right? So there were there were some really really interesting, uh, you know, he said, uh, like, do you think Instagram posts are preventing athletes from blowing their knees out? Do you think? The screenshot of a mechanism of injury is why they got hurt in that moment. And, you know, the yeah. argument that I kind of saw is well, it's just funny. Yes. Right. Like that's like, yes. Yes. Um, like, what are you but talking the about? argument that I'm seeing from non go to coaches yeah. is that there are, there are, there are limitless variables that are impacting why that athlete got injured. Right. There's no way that your set of principles are the reason or the explanation. So, you know, like the flexible, for example, I really like his page. I really like his work. I like his perspectives, yeah. very lifting focused guy, um, you know, has worked with, uh, I, th I think he's worked with Keegan Smith. I know he's worked with uh, Lucas Aaron, who we've had on the podcast before, but hypothetical question, if there are limitless amounts of factors that could impact how or why an athlete got injured, we use it as an opportunity to market our training systems. Whether you agree with the person, the system, the training methods, or the marketing strategy, is it okay to market an athlete when he does well? Assuming we understand that injury can be multifactorial and we can't make it a training method might be better for them. Are we allowed to take responsibility or imply our training methods work just because an athlete has relative success? Because why an athlete does well can be multifactorial as well. So he's, I, I, don't, I think he might be even criticizing this perspective that there are too many factors um, to blame an injury on a coach. Right. And he's like, if there are too many factors to blame an injury on a coach, maybe there are too many factors to blame success on, on a coach too. Like, can you showcase an athlete? If you can't showcase an athlete getting injured and take responsibility for that result, can you showcase an, uh, you know, an athlete succeeding and take responsi responsibility for that result? Especially if there's, you know, if there are limitless factors here, right? Well, Don't I agree somebody... with flexible there because yeah. they're like, um, that. That's what Goda is literally trying to say. There aren't limitless factors. The factors are right here on super slow motion, and we're showing you day by day by day. If you want to ignore it, that's fine. If you want to say it's not okay to put this on here, then, uh, I mean, stop posting athletes' success stories too, right? Like, Or just don't post athletes on social media at all. At all. It makes right. no sense to me. Um, <laughs> they are showcasing their work, and yeah. I just, like, if that's what his... Um, you know, his reasoning behind this is, and then I just don't agree with it. Yeah. And I mean, like what, uh, Zach also, Deck is also saying is like, Hey, like try not to debate in the comment section. Right. Which is ironic. Cause there's over a hundred comments debating in the comment section. Um, isn't that what comment sections are for? <laughs> that's, that's kind of the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a public forum. Right. So, so let's, let's drop yeah. that for a second. Um, Zach did say that this is not a Goda specific, post right he's like you know my comment section is no place for debate and quite honestly neither you nor goda had anything to do with my post so take your trigger fingers elsewhere right so um there's there's a lot of interesting debate here and again i think he's taking a moral stance where it's like he he he, he doesn't think it's a, a good thing to give people athletes publicity when they're getting injured just so that you can get your own clout you know just so that you can boost your own engagement your own post engagement right um interesting where are you seeing this where like i i can't find these people who are posting injuries just to get clout i've never seen it i've seen go to post <laughs> I, you know, it constantly I, I was, 
where they're they're doing it to prove their point in super slow motion. If he wants to ignore it, that's fine. But I'm not seeing any practitioners. Maybe they're they exist, but I don't see it as a major issue. And I do think that uh, he is going with Gota here. He is going against Gota here. I yeah, he may it, have got it, it too feels... much in the comment section and didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> it feels yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny because there aren't a ton of Gota co- like. There's maybe like a handful of Gota coaches who say, you know, coming from the guy who trains people Woda and whatever. Like, there's a few Gota guys in in the comment section, but, um, you know, he he's it's obvious that he was trying to take a, a neutral stance and and talk more about like the, you know, the 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 disrespect element of of trying to showcase a guy while he's getting injured. I think that's what he's arguing, right? He's like, what I'm arguing is using a screenshot of an athlete suffering a split second traumatic injury as an opportunity to market your training methods is, you know, unethical, essentially. You know, you know what uh, is unethical? Unethical, continuing to train people when we know a better way, continuing to train them poorly when you know a better way. And the way to prove that is to watch slow motion. So he's just off here. Um, Unless, you know, it's like, what's worse, posting your butt on Instagram and posting your, you know, shirtless, whatever, to get engagement or to post uh, videos of people in slow or people getting injured in slow motion. Which mm. one is uh, is more negative? Like, I, I just don't see the argument here, and I'm not seeing this as a major issue anywhere. Right. And I think he was you know, going out well, to go to here. Again, you got you got another go to guy. I think we can learn a lot from film. We study game film so much and benefit from it. Shouldn't we be able to do the same thing in the gym and weight room? And and Zach's saying, you know, I 100% agree, but it's not the same thing as sharing an isolated photo of an injury to push your training beliefs, which is what many people do, right? So sure. And and again, like it's funny because there are a lot of people who are who are are saying, yeah, go to does this. You know, like there are people in the comment section. Who, who is like, this has Gota written all over it. And it's obviously a post that criticizes something that, whether or not it is directly about Gota, this is something that Gota does, right? And so I wanted to talk about, you know, not only the validity of, of sharing specific athletes, but also, um, you know, just the validity of, of slow motion video in general, because that is something that, for the most part, people are, you know, like th- that's the big criticism. It's like this, this isn't science. You're just looking at video, right? And and you can't determine, you know, biomechanics scientifically just by looking at video. But when it's Why this not? consistent, well, I, I mean, that's, you know, I haven't, I haven't come up with a conclu- or a, a satisfying answer to that yet necessarily, but that's, cool. that's the argument that I hear, right? There's, uh, I know David Gray has gone after them quite a bit saying that, you know, not using science to validate their methods and, and that there are, there is, you know, there are studies and there is science to say that what they, what they talk about is wrong. Um, but then, you know, go to, will also conversely go and criticize um, the fact that science is cadaver science. It's science based on dead bodies being cut open and being reverse engineered to speculate on what movement is without, uh, you know, looking at actual movement as it happens, right? So one side is saying, well, you need more meticulous study. The other side is like, well, you're not studying actual movement in motion. You're studying dead bodies and trying to deduce how it would move. Who's to say observation? Okay, so what what the slow-mo is, is showing what uh, Gota has observed. And they have no means of uh, doing a quote unquote scientific study because they're not in the institutions of science. However, mm-hmm. that's the institutions of science, not science itself. Okay. Mm-hmm. So science itself would be to draw a hypothesis, observe, which is the slow motion. And the, in, in movement, observation is absolutely key. Okay. So like you can't, it's not like everything else. It's not the same as any other science. Observation is the key variable for movement. Okay. So, um, that's where Gota is doing it way better than anyone else. They're not waiting for academic institutions to bless them from the top and say, this is the right idea here. They're like, mm. Hey, we've observed this thousands of times, please argue the point. And, uh, you know, let's argue inside ankle bone high. Let's argue, uh, pivoting off the fourth and fifth. Let's argue the bow. But a lot of what I'm getting is, uh, either, I don't want to believe Gota at all, and I'm just going to dismiss them and make fun of them. Or, yeah, I like Gota, 
but then never elaborating on what they actually like about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. I, I rarely, have you seen anybody acknowledge the bow like outside of Gota? With, um, the, with, the, the, the bow, when you're talking about the bow, we're talking about the, the leg bow, right? And I've, I've seen, bow. yeah, I've seen people acknowledge that there are bowing mechanics in the body. Um, like <clears> when I say people, pattern. I mean, I was going to say, I was going to say specifically now the Aguilar in functional patterns <clears throat> acknowledges bow mechanics, but it, what, you know, we, we did that whole breakdown of some of his methods and, and how much go to criticizes him or go to adherence, criticize functional patterns, because you don't see that bowing action happening in the leg in any of his forward locomotion. And one of Naudi's core things that he talks about is forward locomotion. It's standing, walking and running and throwing are his four things. Um, and while he he doesn't acknowledge the the same Goda bow, I, Goda Goda is like the bow is basically proprietary to them at this point. It is, but it's actually <laughs> observational. Like, I mean, denying it at this point, I, I would love people to start actually saying there is no bow or acknowledge <laughs> it. One of the two, yeah. right? Because yeah, it, there obviously is one. You can, and that's that's the key. The slow motion shows you that there is a bow, but behind rib cage. Uh, you know, getting into that uh, posterior chain with your hip. Now, um, do you have that David Gray post that I sent you? I believe it was David Gray where... Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, pull, I'll pull it up here. Yeah, not not the Usain Bolt one, the other one. No, the the one where, where he's talking about the throw, the throwing mechanics. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Can you pull that up? Let me, let me see if I can bring that up here. Because it'll highlight the difference between... Uh, you know, go to his observation and what scientists say. And and you know what? You can cherry pick science. There's science for everything. Uh, so many people cherry pick. It's a very usual thing to do for people who follow research to find research that already validates their opinion. Okay. So that happens mm. all the time, literally all the time. And uh, okay. So can you play this and we'll just see what, what goes on here? Let me see if I can if I can get the uh, the sound on here. I have to unplug my headset. Sure. So he he's talking about co contractions, right? Um, I can't actually play with sound, unfortunately, because I have my headphones in, and when my mic's plugged in, it won't play uh, through my speakers. But yeah, no worries. Um, but it's a baseball pitcher. Let's let's describe it here. It's a baseball pitcher, and he's throwing and. Uh, Basically, what I see is a bow being created in the uh, front leg, right? Yeah. So he's going to land in that bow, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll talk about the front leg only at this point, right? So yeah. he lands in the bow. Now, uh, David Gray is saying that uh, – can you scroll up on his, on his feed here? He's saying that instead of a bow, he's not acknowledging the bow. He's saying, look at the co-contractions happening, intra and – and intermuscular contractions, muscle synergists, isometric, reflexes, pre-reflexes, timing, the names don't matter. Um, yeah, but he's landing in a bow and you can see it, okay? So like mm -hmm. he's, he's guessing co-contractions are happening perfectly from a scientific paper, okay? Mm -hmm. And those co-contractions, here's the difference, right? So go to like line up the joints and you, you'll create a bow. And the best movers create the best bows and the strongest bows, okay? This is the leg bowing out slightly, okay? You can land in a bow. Um, that's the landing position, okay? And David Gray is saying, no, no, no. It's actually more about the muscle co-contractions that happen around the joint that keep you safe. So as you're moving in space, the muscles are contracting around, let's say, your knee to keep you mm -hmm. in the right position. Goda actually says... Like if I unpack it a little bit more, Goda actually says that you don't fire muscles on purpose. And I don't believe you do either. I believe the positions are much, much more important um, than actually firing co-contractions. That makes no sense, man. Like co-contractions <laughs> do happen mm. if you look on EMG, but it's not like a baseball pitcher is throwing his pitch. And then he's like, I'm going to contract my VMO, my vastus lateralis, my um, patella or like, you know, patella is not a thing, but like, um, yeah, basically the muscles around the knee. Okay, it happens Nobody's up the chain. Doing that on purpose. It, it, it happens up the chain too, in, in too much of a complex way for you to ever consciously do that, right? Can you scroll up again? Like, uh, 
Sorry, scroll down on that. Nope, the other way. Sorry. Um, okay. So, so, so you know, he go, talks mm -hmm. about the, the importance of, of muscles working together. Um, and he, he does talk, you know, less about, uh, you know, it's not about stretching, it's about positioning, right? So there's there's an element of acknowledging that it, it does, uh, you know, it is about position, right? And the, the better positions that you're in, the more, although efficient movement and healthy joints depend on timing and coordination. That's, that's, that's true. That seems to be his core, his core thesis here. Yeah, but like just go to getting more specific. It's like, let's, let's slow mo and, and check out the bow upon landing. You know, like instead of, can you even see what muscles co contracted ever? Like if I, if I try to perfect my movement or get better movement, can I at any point know about my co contractions? Mm. No, I, I would have to go to David Gray and get rehab where it's like, learn to co contract slowly so that, trust me, bro. You're getting it while you baseball pitch. Where Goat is like, no, no, no. Just get in the positions. Land in the right position. It's much more simple. It's much more clean. And uh, mm. the variables are actually much less. It's like, let's see your bow. You know, so uh, I'm with Goat on this one. Uh, let's see what he's saying here. Well, it, it's, I, I agree you know, with a lot of what he's saying here. So, I mean. So efficient. Well, on, well here, here's the divergence. Here's the divergence that I'm seeing, right? Efficient movement and healthy joints depend on timing and coordination. That's that's the physiotherapist perspective. I think a go to coach would take that and be like, yes, but what what pattern are you coordinating yourself into? You do exactly. have to time it because you do have to time your heel rotating away at the right time. You do have to time your spiral properly so that you're not, uh, you know, unnecessarily loading the joint or producing unnecessary force through through muscular contraction just to propel yourself forward. If you're spiraling properly and you're timing your spiral and you're coordinating your spiral, then your movement becomes so efficient that you don't have the impact on your joint. You don't create the wear and tear because you're transferring that force so efficiently and you don't have to, you know, basically blast your muscle with a ton of, uh, you know, external force, exogenous force, just to propel yourself forward because that, transfer of energy is so smooth and so potent that you can you know that's how you have efficient movement it's it's transference of energy you do have to have good coordination because you have to coordinate an entire spiraling action you do have to corner you do have to you have to coordinate the cornering of your bow you have to be able to create a bow right which is which requires a lot of coordination you have to have your inside ankle bone high you have to be able to pivot on your fourth and fifth metatarsal you have to create that uh, you know that loading through the hip you have to do all that stuff and that is coordination and it and with good timing if your timing is right you're just passing that energy back and forth in a wave it's great right? that so, you said that because like that's what the difference is you're yeah. describing goda's method of coordination where i i believe he's talking about coordination and timing of your co-contractions which mm -hmm. you don't have control over um you just again better hope that you worked on it enough to Make it autopilot happen in the actual movement. Either way, he's not acknowledging a bow. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and and another thing, you can have a bow without having an inside ankle bone high, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, it's just not a, uh, it's not the optimal bow. But a lot of athletes have an amazing bow. Like a lot of the sprinters will have an amazing bow, but they'll go inside ankle bone low, mm -hmm. and you can get away with that for a long time. Like in your teens and twenties, you can get away with that. My hypothesis is that in your 30s, you're going to break down. That's when the WOTA athletes uh, really break down. And I shouldn't say like WOTA. It's like most athletes have many good aspects to them. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back chain dominance. Most of them have that. Uh, most of them have a good bow. Uh, but a lot of them get injured. You know, it, it, things start to break down. Inside ankle bone low, uh, collapsing the foot. Yeah, excess knee values like that, because right? of that foot action. Yeah, exactly. There's, yeah. there's all kinds of stuff that happen. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so for people who are watching live, you know, we're doing, we're doing this as like an open forum discussion. So if you're, if you've been following along any of this stuff for your, you, you know, you want to give your take to, you can hit the knock button and you can actually join us live and, and enter into the conversation. You can share, uh, you know, articles or, or. Uh, different accounts or posts or things that you find relevant. You can also type questions in the chat. Um, we do these on nofilter.net for people who are listening on Spotify and Apple. So you can also check that out. Um, 
you know, what we just talked about, this whole idea of efficient energy transfer, that's one of the big claims that Gota makes that is sometimes ridiculed a little bit in, in the, quote, serious physiotherapy world or the, you know, the athletic training world because they're talking about efficiency of movement based on math, right? And they can use some very esoteric language, specifically, uh, you know, vortex, vortex math, right? And for those who don't know what vortex math is, um, if you ever heard of the Fibonacci sequence, it's the golden ratio. It's the spiraling. Um, like I'll play. I'll play a video it, of Gil explaining it. Just a quick yeah, one. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a formula. It's the Fibonacci sequence. It's this formula that people have called it like the mathematical fingerprint of God, which is consistent within all of nature, right? And there's there's funny. There's a rational wiki article on it, which says it's just ridiculous, right? Uh, like what what's um, ridiculous? The, the the idea Fibonacci of vortex sequence? math in general, yeah, the Fibonacci sequence. Um, that's that's ridiculous that they think it's ridiculous that there isn't repeating patterns happening over and over and over again in nature. Like, uh, if you're yeah, not acknowledging true. that, then we're definitely not going to agree on a lot of things. Uh, to say it's like I can see the counter argument in that I can put a you know a golden ratio on a on a jacket and just be like, oh, look, the jacket's in a golden ratio, right? <laughs> um, something like that, you know, but. I do believe that there is repeating patterns in nature and the circular energy within a human body, the gyroscopes that as go, uh, Gota likes to call them, they work in a series of, uh, infinity movements. Okay. And that's your body going side to side. Anyway, I'm going to let Gil explain this and then we'll talk a little bit further. Can you crank the volume a little bit and you can go ahead and pause game on your computer? Game yeah. All you have to do is roll into a, into a it's time, max, which is right. basically the fetal position to sports. Uh, we don't ever in Gona actively fire a muscle because we are programming with energy weight. So we put the body's parts, what we call the bony landmarks, in the mathematical equation. And the golden ratio, the Fibonacci sequence, vortex math, and ancient geometry. By putting the body in the mathematics of energy, then the muscle. Okay, so. so could that, you pause that, that for a sec? So, so, right there. so, so what he just said for those who couldn't quite make it, what he said, there was a question that said, Hey, do you ever squeeze your adductors when you're with, when your feet are on those slant boards? So go to, will you know, take, take two slant boards, put them in a little triangle, and then you put your feet on there that produces the inside ankle bone high position. Right. And then the question that, that Gil was answering is like, Hey, do you ever squeeze your, your, your adductors, as in like, do you ever pull your legs in? And what he said was, we never actively contract a muscle because we're not training muscle contraction. We're training to put yourself within the mathematics of efficient movement. So we're, we're programming, making your bony landmarks. So if you ever listened to our episodes on the feet, when we talked about that bony bridge on the outside of the feet, creating like almost like a half moon shape, and that's how the force transfers from the you know outer mid part of your foot all the way to the end where you pivot off of it. You, you're training that efficient transfer of energy. He's saying we don't train muscle contraction, we train energy waves. Now, when someone uses a term like energy waves, people kind of raise their eyebrows because they're like, what the is this guy talking about? Right? Like, of, of course you want to like everything's about bigger, stronger muscles. Um, you know, more resilient tissues, more force output for uh, athletic tr training, but no one really thinks about how, how do you uh, transfer the energy in a way that's efficient and, and, you know, carries from one, you know, a wave from one side to the next so that you can, you know, basically use this energy that's already happening, you know, like you're already falling forward, you're already being pulled down. Um, there's, there's already forces in play that are, that are, you know, affecting you how do you use these forces how do you use the energy of these forces efficiently within the human body yeah so a few things there like um if you're trying to prove an energy wave and you're looking at the studies you're not going to find it okay because you have to hypothesize it first in order to do a study on it right and i haven't seen this yet i think goda is literally the first one who they didn't invent it but they're observing it and that's why all their observations are done with 
you know, slow mo, ultra slow mo on you know iPads or whatever, which they call hilariously they call it a uh, um, what's it called six K um, supercomputer. <laughs> it's just an iPad, right? Like they, I think they yeah. like to take the piss out of people with that stuff. But yeah, you're not gonna find that golden ratio Fibonacci. You're not gonna find that idea within the movement science, quote unquote science research. It's not gonna be there. It'll probably be there in physics. I'm not going to look because I just want to observe. And I observe mm. over and over and over and over and over again that because that's the best way to do it with movement. Observe and try it yourself. And if it doesn't work, scrap it, right? Like maybe that's a little bit of a simplification, but I'd rather observe something a thousand times over than read a paper on it and just guess. Because with movement, there's too many nuances and too many variables. Um, now, another thing is the him talking about uh, never firing a muscle. Now, that is very interesting stuff right there. Never firing a muscle on purpose. What right, and, and that's like within within their training system, right? And so, so um, one of the things that I try to remember when I'm talking about Goda is that Goda has applications in athletic training, right? Like the GLS performance team uh, trains football players and baseball players, and they, you know, but but Goda is not a training system; it's a movement system, right? So what when you're when you're quote training goda what you're really doing is you're coding movement patterns and learning how to be efficient with your with your training patterns so you wouldn't necessarily want to actively go contract your muscles necessarily because you're not training your muscles you're training your movement now training movement trains muscles right like if you if you get into these certain patterns your muscles are going to start developing in a certain way uh they are go to trainers who um you know take these movement principles and they apply them to training programs. You got uh, coaches like coach Carly who will do like, you know, a gazillion, like 400 reps of these different go to patterns and it fires her glutes. And, you know, she's, she's getting like, you know, her, her clients to they'll build muscle and do all this stuff. You get Rick and, and Gary in the GLS performance team and they're, and you know, like, Gary was telling me, you know, we, we, you know, we get guys who put on 20 pounds in the off season and they, they might not look like bodybuilders, but they're still putting on weight and they're still putting on size and we're training them goda right like we're still focusing on pushing forward locomotion and that's that's basically it now so, go ahead sorry, go ahead no i was i was just saying it's like the the idea of not deliberately contracting a muscle is i think you know the, if you're thinking about training coordinated movement right which is what go is it's a movement system. So you're trying to train and pattern coordinated movement. You don't want to isolate muscles. You're then you're just like taking a part of the chain and you're focusing on one link in the chain and you're isolating it. Versus if you, you when you look at a movement system, putting yourself in these patterns and these positions will automatically cause the right muscles to contract. Right? That's the key right there. Yeah. I think. It's it's yeah. uh, being in the right position will fire muscles. However, when you're training, you don't have to purposely fire a muscle. Like let's say a glute bridge where you're pumping your uh, glutes up and down, you know, like in a laying position, a supine position, and you're really pumping that muscle up. I think Goda would say that's unnecessary beyond maybe a warm-up, and even then, I don't think they would do it. Um, where if you put your body in the right position, the muscles will fire properly because the Fibonacci sequence uh, – golden ratio and whatever you called it vortex math is in the right place now i can see how when he says something like that people just go wild because they're it's very hard to prove right but really he he explains it pretty simply 22 5 out 22 5 in your tibia and your femur are internally rotating after they externally like you land ideally in their world with both the tibia and the femur uh, externally rotated and they do a spin internal as you push off okay so you land external you push off internal and the marker that you're doing it properly will be a heel away okay and we can add in the inside ankle bone high being a cherry on top of that or i think they would say it's a major component of it but um, yeah, and that's that's like a structural component, right? Because as soon as we and we talked about this in many of our episodes, as soon as your inside ankle bone drops, then you're not 
creating the bow as much, your knee starts to kind of get into a valgus. You're doing that counter bone rotation. We got the lower limb rotating in, the upper limb rotating out. That's where your knees start getting a little jacked up, right? So, so it's it's they're talking about structural integrity of creating this bow so that you can, you know, create this this sort of efficient movement, this efficient well, transfer of energy. Yeah, and they make specific claims. They're like around twenty degrees out and around twenty degrees in is optimal for mm. movement. Okay, with a little bit of variability here and there, and obviously. If you've been uh, quote unquote decoded or you know you're out of shape, it's not going to look like that. There's going to be a lot of problems. So we're moving towards a 225 in or 225 out. That's your kneecap to a 225 in 45 degree change, ideally within your movement, within your uh, landing and leaving. Now the vortex energy is literally just your hip going around the corner, meaning that when your heel goes away your hip also takes a turn. I don't think anyone disagrees with this. Like when you actually ask somebody, let's slow motion a run and watch what the hips are doing. The hips, even if you're stiff, the hips will somewhat come around the corner. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like when you're moving, <clears throat> unless you're very, very, very stiff or have a major issue. Right. So usually <laughs> um, the hip will do that somewhat. So I don't think anyone disagrees with that point but they wouldn't call it a vortex energy. So go to like, yeah, you're landing in a bow, you're leaving in a corner, that uh, kneecap is going 22.5 out to 22.5 in, your hip bone is actually taking a little bit of a turn and you just land on the other side the exact same way at a 22.5 out, ideally, 22.5 in, hip goes around the corner, you're using that fourth and fifth as the pivot point to go around. And there's your vortex energy, it's back and forth the same energy is going back and forth on both sides of the body. And your goal is to try to catch that energy to properly time and coordinate your body so that you're hitting that almost every time with a little bit of variability, depending on what you're doing. Right. So mm -hmm. obviously you're not going to go 22 five out when you're running back and you have to, you know, do a, a crazy movement to get away from a, someone trying to tackle you. Right. There's going to be variability there, but you'll always see the, bow when you watch barry sanders doing his uh you know that's one of the best running backs of all time when he's laterally moving his body is is like sideways it's crazy the amount of force he's able to take but you will see his foot on the outside edge you will see a major bow okay almost every time and the best movers display this in my opinion and uh, yeah so that's that's really the vortex energy um now, there is other practitioners who uh, acknowledge this. Like, uh, mm. yeah, there we go. Yeah, I got a picture of Barry Sanders up here. And, like, you can see even even as he's, like, his, his, his feet are kind of, like, way off to the side, he's still got that outside edge and a corner in that support leg. Exactly, right? Like, I, I mean, again, there's going to be a lot of variability here, but I, I think Gota has – at least something that people should look into. I think they're correct on this, to be honest, but I, I don't understand not trying to look at it yourself in slow motion. You know, it's like almost like the industry and everyone's just trying to ignore it when it's clearly something that shouldn't be ignored, you know, yeah. just because it doesn't fit the scientific rigor of, um, you know, studies and papers, which, I mean, I, I think GOAT is open to, getting this studied by an institution, they're just not going to do it themselves. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think they think that like the slow motion is evidence enough. Like if you're not able to observe this yourself as a movement specialist, mm -hmm. then there may be an issue in their mind. Right. So um, it's interesting stuff. And that's, you know, like this, this idea of observation is, is, I think it's, I think it is really, really important because they're saying it's like, hey, we got these, we got these ideas, right? By the way, um, Tim Tim Hewitt. Do you know who Tim Hewitt is? I don't know. So he's he's a like he's from the Mayo Clinic of Sports, and he's the medicine director of biomechanics. He's uh, he's one of the world's leading researchers in prevention of non-contact ACL injury, specifically, Ooh. and. Uh, and he actually looked at Gota stuff and he talked about why it worked. 
works for preventing ACL injuries, right? So you get this guy who's actually, you know, part of the Mayo Clinic, who is one of these researchers who, you know, everyone quotes when they're talking about like the science, the science, the science. He's one of the, one of the guys that, you know, has been, you know, conventionally used as, as a, an argument against Gota. He had, he had this two minute video with the, uh, on on the GLS page talking about why you know ener like energy based movement which can't be confined to a plane why it would be applicable which is you know like basically the go to method why it would be applicable to preventing ACL injuries that's interesting I haven't watched it so I can't really comment on it yeah well I'll 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 send it to you and you can find it on on the you know the GLS underscore training page and we yeah. can we can look at it later but um. But basically, like there, what Gota does, as opposed to just doing pure scientific study, is you know, and I've talked about this there, you know, like in the scientific method, you start with an observation, but then you go and test it, right? Most of most of what uh, what Gota started as was the, the observation, and now they're doing a lot of the testing, right? And they're they're also inviting people. It's like, look, make the observations yourself and see if you can observe something that doesn't line up with what we're seeing as in see if you can find someone having a major acl injury or a major you know knee injury where their inside ankle bone is high and they're creating a good strong bow try to find it show, show it to us right and so so it's not it's <laughs> it's it's not that they're not open to being wrong it's just like and this is this is how I came to really really think of of Gota as legitimate was not only did I have like when I when I, okay when I first heard of Gota I had the same reaction as a lot of people which is like you're talking about like some of the most esoteric random shit you're talking about not lifting weights you're talking about all these things that like sound so wrong to me and not legit and you just you know there's this fat dude with the with a with an you know an American accent and you know like I I didn't want to listen right and then when I looked into the actual claims and the actual observations and I tried to find things that that went against their claims I couldn't find anything I couldn't find any video evidence that they were wrong I couldn't find any actual scientific evidence that they were wrong uh, the scientific evidence that I did find was you know explained to me really well why it was uh, you know the cadaver science and not quite on the same level as what they were observing um, but the big thing was I couldn't find any video evidence of, of people getting injured while following the secure patterns that they talked about and so it was really hard for me to be like no go is wrong when I didn't have any reason for them to be wrong um yeah it's, it's interesting like I, I I could find science that goes against Gota 100% and science being peer-reviewed paper like um you know the first metacarpal phalangeal joint like basically going off the big toe is like a staple for a lot of people postural restoration institute uh david gray i know had this uh you know um ikn pretty much everybody almost everybody mm -hmm. except for david weck and uh gota pretty much that i know is saying go off the big toe you can find a million citations and uh you know papers that say go off the big toe now go to come and say no 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 we have a better way to do it uh, according to the science they're wrong okay like in terms of the amount of papers out there that will go against that claim that you should go off the big toe because most people have gone off the big toe when i observe in real life i see most people f defaulting into that big toe okay now mm -hmm. is it because they have they are not patterned correctly their inside ankle bone is low um all that um, in terms of science, it doesn't really matter because I could just pick a paper and just be like, look, you're wrong. <laughs> but um, if you observe it over and over and over again, and you're, you're seeing an inside ankle bone high being protective for injury, and mm. um, you, know, you're, you have a different way of doing it, a pivot point around the fourth and fifth, which I personally use with way better success then I can only go with the observation here. I have to dump the this quote unquote science at this point and go with what I have observed and how it feels for my own movement. Okay. Um, again, the papers will tell me I'm wrong. So 
what is actually, what is science here? Is science the body of literature done by the institutions or is science observation, hypothesis, uh, testing, repeatable testing, being open with your methods, being open with your results? I think that's science. And uh, I think Goda's doing all that. So I think Goda actually has yeah. more of a scientific body of work, making specific claims that anybody can access. That's the key. Anybody can access this. Not everybody knows how to search for papers. And in fact, nobody knows how to search for papers. It's like no. literally people who have trained in science and uh, a few other nerdy people who are like, I need to know the science, right? Mm -hmm. Most people have no idea. They just, they pick something up and said, Har you know, Harvard scientist says this, so it's gotta be correct. It's Harvard. Well, now right? you're, now you're talking about, now you're talking about science journalism, right? And there's, there's, you know, we, we do have our whole episode on, you know, using science and being able to think for yourself. Um, what I hear is you're kind of differentiating between the scientific method, which is the actual process of discovering things through a scientific process. You're talking about um, a scientific institution and their consensus. So the consensus made by scientific institution and like basically a, a, a group of peers who consider themselves elite in the realm of discovering and defining knowledge, um, which is to say these people spend the most time studying certain things, they're studying, you know, they're studying their own information within their own paradigm and they have their own sets of gatekeepers. We talked a lot about gatekeeping in scientific institutions and how a lot of information would not uh, make it. So an idea like Goda would not survive or thrive in a, uh, you know, a scientific institution environment because it doesn't agree with the concurrent models of scientific understanding. Because it's so far outside of the, outside of the gate, trying to get a peer review would basically get blasted by all the other information that's saying, no, you got to come off the first toe, for example. Um, you know, now you, science journalism is even more insidious because now you have, you know, people who are semi-scientifically literate spoon feeding the, in, you know, a biased interpretation of a, an abstract of a study to large groups of people. You know, it's like when you see my, my favorite example that, that's very easy to understand is when people say scientists say that red wine and chocolate is good for your heart or good for your health, right? It's like obviously eating alcohol or uh, eating chocolate and drinking alcohol every night is not going to be good for you. It's not going to be healthy. But, you know, take take, a, you know, an abstract about the polyphenol content of, you know, which is so abstract that they study these polyphenols in isolation in a cell dish and it had a positive antioxidant effect in these cells and, you know, in a Petri dish. And so now eating chocolate and drinking red wine is suddenly healthy for you, according to science journalism, right? Th this is the quality of like misinformation that gets thrown around in science journalism. And this is how most people, when they say, let's follow the science, this is what happens to them, right? They end up misinterpreting uh, well, first of all, they can't interpret science themselves, so they rely on journalists to interpret it for them. But usually journalists are, are, are barely scientifically literate themselves, and they're going in and, and interpreting an abstract of a study, not even necessarily looking at the whole study itself, and reporting it to people in, in a way that hopefully laymen would understand. Add to the fact that most media relies on clickbait, and you know titles that would sound good that's why you end up getting a chocolate and red wine is good for you situation is because people want to be like oh tell me something good about my bad habits so they'll misinterpret it based on what they think will create a bigger audience response and that's how you get science being misinterpreted even more right um so that's that's you know that's some of the limitations just to, you know of of just you know saying i'm going to use science to understand and learn about movement is that first of all do you, do you even know how to interpret a scientific study i don't i've been trying to figure that out for years i can i can you know wiggle my way around some nutrition studies and some stuff some bio some basic biochem stuff because i put like hundreds of hours trying to figure out how to do that was it worth it not really to be honest because <laughs> Because again, there's the, you can you can find a study to support anything. That's that's the other thing that I realized. Is you can literally find a study to support anything. You can just isolate it enough. You can create a you can. This is why cherry picking studies is such a big issue in in both the nutrition and the exercise science field. Yeah, I mean the the 
scientists who want to counter that would say that, oh, it's actually, it's the higher body of work. You don't just pick one study to verify what you claim. You have to pick a, a bigger body where the conclusions are from the best journals and the top scientists, what they say goes, and the journals that are less, like farther down the line, yeah. we're not going to pick up what they say. But then your study won't get into a higher journal if it's not saying the right thing. Okay. So it, you never, you rarely get a paper in a really high up journal that goes way against the paradigm because that's just not how it operates. Okay. And uh, I can tell you from my experience in sciences and university, I've never single one time heard somebody counter a scientific claim from a professor. Okay. Like the, the base scientific, the amount of volume that's thrown at you in school does mm. not lend to really diving deep into a scientific principle or first principle. Okay. So we're just, we're given what we're told and it, it's true because the, of course it's true. The scientific uh, literature says it's true and the body of science says it's true. That is acting more like a religion. Okay. Even though the counter argument would be, no, it's not a religion because we have evidence. Religion uh, relies on, you know, ghosts and, and, uh, you know, no evidence there, right? Yeah. Evidence, but you're reifying your own interpretation. You're reifying that science is the evidence where I'm saying with movement observation and actually going out and doing your own movement is better science than picking out a literature. You can do both. Mm. There's nothing wrong with doing both. And there is a lot of good science. I'm not completely uh, shitting on it because we're not, we're not anti-science, the art of move. Like we're just, we're talking, we're, 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 we're speaking specifically to some of the limitations and also not falling into the trap of, you know, just saying that science, anything that has the word science attached to it is universally good, right? We are, we are pro-science here at the art of move. In fact, that's why we take the approaches that we do in trying to discover the truth behind human biomechanics is that we're, we're, we're looking at every angle. I'm pro actual science, not gate <laughs> science. Okay. So I'm pro, uh, observing, hypothesizing, uh, testing and drawing a conclusion and then putting the work out there like goat is doing. Okay. And sh prove me wrong. That is science uh, to a T now. Because we've been a little bit, as a society, science is institutions. It comes out of Harvard. It comes out of, you know, the highest universities is where the science comes from. We've been conditioned to believe that that is science. That is not science. That is a way to show you a body of work of science. However, it's not science in itself. To me, that's scientific uh, institutions. The fact that you, like, if you think that you can only do science through an institution, to me, that's wild at this point. Okay. You can do science on your own. You can test things on your own. That's not a, especially with movement. That is a thing that you can do. So, so it's really interesting because, you know, some of the gold standards of scientific validity, you get like something like a double blind peer reviewed study, right? And some of the benefits of, of going an institutional route in scientific study is that you have peers to basically be like, Hey, you kind of like your, your test design is kind of shit, you know, like you need yeah. to, like, you're not actually getting the right information in, in, you know, having peers to gatekeep your own methods and to ensure that the quality of observation is, is high. And they're, you know, like that's, that's really, really good. Right. Um, go to kind of doing that in an open forum. <laughs> like they're like, Hey, here are the observations. Here's what we're seeing. Here's what we're testing. And everyone's trying to criticize them, but there's no, there's no actual good criticism of what they're doing right that, now. That's the question. Can science be an open forum or does it have to be through the institutions? Right. Right. I, I, I think it can be an open forum in general, yeah. right? Like you can, you can still test things. You can still, um, you know, come to, you can still get information by, by applying the scientific method. What's interesting is when you have a big, lar like a large body of work um, and you have like a ton of different studies, then you can do things like meta analyses and you can, uh, you know, start investigating, okay, what does all this information mean in a big picture sense? 
um, there's there's a ton of benefits to to having like you know an institution that is dedicated to the practice and study of science. What you brought up, which I find interesting, is this idea of a reification fallacy. For those who are listening who don't know what that is, um, really easy example of a reification fallacy could be saying, "Hey, um, the Bible is the word of God," and someone says, "Why?" It's like, well, because the Bible says so, right? So it's like, it's information within a thing. Like, it's almost like looping itself back and using itself as proof without actually providing evidence or providing proof of it, um, you know, up front. Um, so when you're, when you're talking about science being guilty of a reification fallacy, it's like you're, you're up, you know, you're studying science and you're studying these things and you're coming up with these hypotheses that, if they don't fit within the current paradigm of understanding of your peers within an institution, then it's going to be gate, like you said, gate kept. Uh, and all science has to base, it ends up can, can, can fall into the trap of being an echo chamber and information within scientific institutions can be guilty of the reification fallacy because it's using its own information and its own models of understanding to continually uh, you know, prove itself. It's the circle, scientific circle jerk, so to speak, right? Which is why, that's, go ahead. So that's absolutely key. When I was in university, it was more like when something's told to you, you think it's the best information, period. Okay, it's the top information. You're at the university. Of course, it's the top information. So <laughs> if somebody tells me otherwise, I can go to my body of work, which is the, you know, the scientific literature, and I can pull out a paper, and that is the truth. That in itself is a reification fallacy, even though it might be true or it might be good information, it's still looking within your own sources to validate your claims, right? So like, again, the Bible being the example, people can see this one, right? So it's like, uh, do you have proof of God? Yes, the Bible. Do you have proof that the Bible is, is the word of God? It's like, God said so. Right, so it's it's this circular argument, and sciences are doing it in the same way with their with the peer reviewed uh, literature. Right now, they would again counter that with, "Oh, it's it's evidence. It's a body of evidence, and we've done this for this way for so long. And if you don't want to come along, then that's fine. Uh, you can well, actually, they don't say it's fine. They they yell at you. <laughs> <laughs> they call you stupid. But basically, that's what Gota has to deal with right now. Right, so." Um, they're going against the grain. They're going to get a lot of crap and a lot of like, um, I would say unfair treatment because they're not following the biblical scientific model that's out there where you don't even realize that you think that the truth is coming from only one source. Mm. Okay. So in itself, when you think like this, again, when I was in school, I never heard anybody in science challenge a first principle okay i've never heard somebody let's just say anything gravity okay like learning gravity in in school nobody ever challenged it because you would think it was ridiculous right but the amount of people that actually can give you a model of gravity out there who claim to be scientific i don't think that they there's not that many right like um in actuality people are like things fall down that's gravity okay but like i don't mm. think anybody can unpack it and really tell you what it is okay maybe senior physicists but everybody would be like of course we know this blah 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 right so yeah i'm not saying that gravity's wrong i'm saying that uh people would say that <laughs> it's just an example right a... like it's it's like you can't you can't explain where the electricity that you use every day comes from but no one would question that electricity exists either exactly i, I was given a really bad example there because everybody <laughs> like believes in gravity and of course it, like things fall down right so not the best mm. example but there's a million examples like that where you just take the word and it's the word, right? So when you're learning, there's a lot of things that you probably thought were completely true when going through institutions that on upon inspection didn't turn out to be true. When I was in school, for example, epigenetics was not a thing, okay? It was, it was emerging and I was looking at it outside the institution, but it was not within the institution. They would deny it. Okay. And laugh at it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. you know, learning bodybuilding within kinesiology in school was the best way to work out. Okay. Um, there's a lot of these examples and when you're in school and when you're in university, you don't realize that a lot of them can be challenged. A lot of the first principles can be challenged. Mm. You just don't have time to do it and realize that you can do it. 
And I mean, like, that's sort of like, you know, when you're thinking about these institutions, they're academic institutions for the most part, and students are not there for, you know, open forum discussions about the information. They're there to have the information crammed into their heads because they're the students. They're the ones who are learning, right? So um, when you get people who are saying, uh, actually, I'm going to question this. I, I observed something completely different, and we're going to investigate this. We're like, well, why are you investigating that? We already have this body of literature that explains what you're what you're trying to find. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't really agree with these first principles that I'm observing, right? And that's, I think ultimately that's why we need to validate uh, observation, you know, going back to the Zach Deck post where it's like, don't post photos of athletes getting injured as a means to boost engagement. You know, I still think it's okay. Like maybe the intention is wrong if you're just doing it to get attention, but if you're doing it genuinely to like, you know, continue the thread of an observation that you've found and you're you're genuinely educating people and you're noticing different patterns and you're trying to you're 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 being investigative then like you know if it's if you got the film look at the film you know like i think i think you got to make these observations for yourself you got to be able to to not <laughs> and and again like just to reiterate like i thought goto was stupid until i made observations myself like i really like the, the esoteric language that Gil used, like vortex math, um, you know, like the, you know, he's, he, he literally says vortex math, Fibonacci golden ratio, never explaining what it is either. <laughs> never, ex you know, like almost like there's a pre-assumption that people should know what it is. But then when you actually make the observations and you, you notice what, the, you know, you, you're, you're seeing that, wow, okay, their principles are legit. Like I can't find anyone getting injured while demonstrating these behavior patterns and every injury that I'm watching in slow motion is demonstrating these insecure patterns that they're talking about lead to injury, then shit, like maybe they're onto something. Making observations and thinking for yourself and not just accepting, again, this ambiguous thing that the science says, you know, because again, the science can say anything. You can pick, you can cherry pick any study that you want. You can find any you know, shitty science journalism interpretation of an abstract that you don't really understand and the journalist doesn't really understand. You can you can spend a ton of time and you can you can also make the mistake of saying that's because someone else studied something more than you have that you can't make your own observations. That's, that's absolutely not true. It's absolutely what I used yeah. to do in terms of uh, you know I, I used to look up to to other coaches who would say shit that I didn't agree with or nutrition scientists that I thought you know that doesn't sound right. Uh, and and doesn't go with my my personal experience, but you, you you can absolutely think for yourself. Even if someone who quote has studied more than you or is more knowledgeable or quote credible, you can still you can still think for yourself. We were learning the food pyramid, and this is the old <laughs> food pyramid in nutrition class in university. Like, come to find out, like I'm thinking that I'm getting the best information possible. Come to find out that the you know the dairy uh, industry. The milk industry is literally funding both sides of the Canadian government. Okay. So like we're getting that as teaching us that that's the truth. And because I'm there in the institution going, of course, I'm learning the best information. I just took it as knowledge. This is, you know, eating grains, like 12 servings yeah. of grains a day and like whatever, <laughs> eight, eight servings of milk a day. I'm chugging milk, getting myself sick. Being you know, like, what's going on here? You know, um, it's just so ridiculous. I have a million examples like that, yeah. um, maybe in a future episode of what I learned and it at the time thinking that it's solid gold and turns out to be completely like the opposite. Okay. And that's with, Oh, I want to do that episode. Yeah. That's like uh, my, my brother, my brother, uh, you know, is, is highly university educated in, in uh, biochemistry and virology and computer science. He got like three degrees basically. Um, or two degrees, but with like a bunch of majors and minors, you know? Um, and, and I remember one time, one day he comes home, I was living with him at the time while he was in university. He's like, Hey, I learned that, uh, you know, actually omega six oils are actually better for you. Like uh, vegetable oils and stuff, you know, better, better for you than saturated fat. And I learned why. And, and we had this whole, you know, at the time I was just, you know, I was like, I was learning about how bad seed oils were for you and how bad omega sixes were and how inflammatory they were. And we had this big discussion. He's like, no, canola oil is the healthiest. It's like, Alex, it's literally an industrial lubricant. <laughs> it wasn't even, it was never designed for human consumption. 
it's uh, first of all, canola doesn't even exist. It's actually uh, a plant called rapeseed. So <laughs> it already has a PR disaster behind it, but it was literally an, an industrial lubricant and omega-6 fatty acids. Like I, I did this whole experiment where it's like, I'm pretty sure omega-6s in these inflammatory oils are what cause sunburns, right? So I had this, I cut them out for like a whole year basically and ate nothing but like coconut oil and saturated fat, beef tallow, all these like really, you know, good healthy fats for me for an entire year. And then I went out on the hottest, I, sh I should be dead. I should be dead. I went out on the hottest day of the year uh, in the sun for, I think it was like 18 straight hours in the middle of the summer by a lake in Halifax. And I got a light tan and that was it. You know, didn't burn, did not burn at all. That's and uh, it was, it was super fascinating. I want to talk more about that later, but I, you know, I just remember this whole frustration where it's like, is this what they're teaching him in university that canola oil and, and omega-6 fatty acids from veg, like processed vegetable oils are healthier than naturally occurring fats in animal foods. That's what I learned in, uh, in university in Cairo school, we did learn much better information, but in university, that was the, uh, that was what was taught. And, uh, that's how I, I lived my life. It was another thing is the similarities of molecules. Okay. So if you mm. get a molecule, let's say within a, a naturally, a natural piece of fruit, let's say, right. Versus a molecule within a cap, like a pill, they're the exact same thing. Right. And I, I still think that most uh, educated people would say that, mm. that you're, you're having the exact same experience with both molecules, right. Coming from a natural source and coming from an artificial source. Mm. You could just pop pills all day instead of eating natural foods and you'll be fine because it's the same molecules. It's the same process as going through your body. Yeah. Right. So, well, this, this is really interesting. I remember having debates about nutrition with people, um, you know, specifically about how fructose is bad for you because a lot of the studies on fructose, uh, are done with isolated fructose molecules and they cause, you know, liver issues and they cause, uh, you know, excess adiposity as in fat. Um, and if you isolate fructose from fruit, then it behaves differently than if it is packaged with the water and the fiber and the micro and macro and phytonutrients that are in it. Like what people don't understand, you know, it's like, it's when you see, when I saw the Soylent thing, if you've ever heard of that, it was like a bunch of Silicon Valley tech guys uh, doing exactly what you just said, taking the molecule constituents of what your nutrient requirements were and putting it into a powder form specifically so they never had to eat food again. And it's like, that's not going to work. That's not, it's not well, going to work. They think it'll work because it's the exact same molecule. So why wouldn't it work? Because they're the exact same. Your body won't recognize the difference between the two. Um, the, uh, this goes with a lot of scientific people think that genetically modified foods are good for you, that they'll, they're going to help humanity and that we should eat genetically modified foods basically all the time. Like I'm literally in a group on Facebook called genetically modified humans for Monsanto, right? So they love <laughs> Monsanto and there's hundreds of thousands of scientists in here, right? It's not just like a, yeah. a one-off thing. And they praise, you know, like the genetically modified foods and say it's the exact same equivalent as a natural food. Now, if you buy that, you're probably going to be uh, doing some woe to things at the gym. <laughs> I'm going I'm to put the two together, right? Um, it's a mindset shift really in science. Let me unpack this a little bit. When you're in scientific classes, you're taking one molecule and you're studying it, but there's a hundred thousand or who knows, trillion molecules that are interacting with that molecule, right? Like it's not a cut and dry thing where you can isolate one molecule and just observe its behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think science actually promotes this. Right. Where it's like, let's study whatever it is. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say something that's happening right now. Let's study one thing. Is there an effect? Okay. Yeah. And wait, we haven't studied the hundred thousand other things that could be affected. We're only studying one thing, you know, like, uh, yeah. that's the thing. You won't hear the things about like that. You're not studying. You'll only hear about what is studied. Okay. Yeah. So when we think about molecules, and how they how they behave keep in mind that you're just looking at one process 
and it's very, very difficult to do. Let's take lactic acid in a liver, okay? Are you sure that you, like when I learned it, it's, it's this like nice chart and it goes lactic acid to this other molecule to switch to this molecule. And there's a picture of a liver and the molecule's going through. Now in my actual liver, that's not happening, okay? Like there's a million <laughs> interactions that are happening that you probably haven't taken a look at with lactic acid, but they're not showing up because you never studied them. You get what I'm saying there? So it's like, mm -hmm. you're looking at one thing and you're isolating it and saying, this is the only variable I like to, to look at. So um, this is how it behaves. And since it's peer reviewed studies, that's the truth. Okay. So it's really not as cut and dry as you think when you're learning molecules, there's a trillion different processes, chemical processes going on in your body at the same time. We've studied none of them or like, I mean, the minuscule amount, okay. Min minuscule amount of them. Like a fraction so of a fraction. Like, exactly. To think we know much about the body at this point in terms of, you know, physiologically even, um, how the nervous system works, how the lymph system works. There was literally no education in university, uh, in health sciences on the lymph system. It was more like, where is it? Like, where did the cords go through? <laughs> that, that was the education within, you know, the institutions. It's like, find out where, what muscle is innervated by what nerve. It's literally what cord is connecting to what muscle. And then when you learn it, you're like, whoa, I know a lot now. To me now, it's just so, <laughs> like, it's, it's nothing. Okay. Like, I, I don't even need to know that. It's, hmm. it's useless information that was crammed into my head. And I, I probably spent hundreds of hours on it finding out where the cords go through. And, and there is, you know, pertinence to this within like uh, therapy. I, I don't want to like bash a nerve. I have to know where it is, but does that supersede knowing how the nerves work? You, do you get what I'm saying mm -hmm. there? It's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's a million different ways to look at one thing and we isolate them and believe that we know all about them. It's yeah. And that's, like when we're talking about like studying things in isolation, there's also a lot of useless or, or not useless, but like no information that can't be applied to anything necessarily. Right. Like for, for example, like as a chiropractor, as someone who, who is doing manual therapy and, and, you know, rehabilitative therapy on, on your clients, like how often do you use the information of what nerve is, is innervating a, a you know, a bicep muscle? Um, I, I do use that only because if there's an issue, I mm. I have to know where it, where it comes from, right? So yeah. th there is that information, but for the most part, if there isn't a major issue, I don't need to to look at that, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's more like the, the information is not completely useless, but it's very very minute portion of it. I would rather yeah. know how the nerves work in actuality, and uh, like within electricity, within, you know, uh, how it actually works, how it actually functions. This is still a mystery within science. Okay. Mm. Like the actual mechanics behind it. Yeah. I know there's a potassium sodium pump that switches. I know all that. Okay. So, um, I'm not completely ignorant of this stuff. I know quite a bit. I've taken neuroscience courses, like all that stuff. Um, However, I don't think that at a fundamental level, we know how nerves and the nervous system and the brain actually operate. Mm. And that's, uh, you know, that's again, acknowledging that, uh, th th that's the other thing. When my brother started studying science in university, I remember when he started, he's like, you know, one of the things that I went in thinking was that people had figured everything out. We knew at least the basic, you know, first principles of everything and that I was just going to go learn them and then kind of expand a little bit on the, on the fringes of this basic core knowledge that we knew was right. And then I realized we knew nothing. You know, it was like the, the one thing studying science made me realize is how little we actually know. I found that really interesting because, because a lot of scientists don't have that, that, that mentality. They still think it's like this established core body of work that's, that can, you know, perfectly explain everything in existence. And, and, you know, you, you can still discover stuff, but like the people really assume that the first principles are all figured out by, you know, whatever institution that they're looking at. So I think, uh, you know, this, this, this conversation has been a little more in depth than we normally go. Right. Because we're, we're talking, we're talking about being able to look at 
outside of the box methods like observing slow motion video as a as a proper method to discerning behavior and and truth and 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 vol- like valid theories of movement we're talking about you know being open minded to hear guys like gill talk about vortex math and not contracting muscles and and creating ultimate efficiency in an energy wave and and being able to like you know hear this guy and entertain these ideas and to be able to think for yourself uh you know and not immediately sort of regress to well, no, like that's not scientific, <laughs> you know, um, not regress that and, and actually be able to test things for yourself, make your own observations, make your own, um, you know, understandings. Uh, so for those who are listening, we'd love to know your thoughts, um, you know, from, from in terms of what we talked about today, do you think that people should or should not post uh, videos and pictures of athletes getting injured? You know, uh, is that is that a valid way of observing and learning about biomechanics is that an ethical thing to do on social media is that is that a little sketchy um you know how how do you approach thinking for yourself do you just rely on big bodies of science do you do your own tests do you make your own observations how do you how do you go about you know discerning information for yourself and what and and is the scientific method part of your movement practice do you test things for results on a regular basis do you test uh, how things feel in your body and if they don't feel great in your body do you getting outside of you? Do you have coaches? Do you have peers? Uh, what What is your approach? What are your thoughts? Um, we'd love to know if you have any questions. Feel free to reach out. We do these on nofilter.net, which has a live chat where you can ask your questions in real time. And you can also hit the knock button. There's a little button for the viewers. You can hit knock and you can request to join the stream yourself, which I think is super, super cool. Um, for those who listen live, thank you so much for checking out episode 24 of The Art of Move. Tomorrow we got a cool guest. His name is Adrian Vino. Uh, I, I met him like almost a decade ago when I started my career as a personal trainer. And we're going to talk to him because he combines Goda with bodybuilding. Like he's a bodybuilder, but he practices Goda literally every day. It's his core movement practice, but he still bodybuilds. And we're going to talk to him about how he can balance uh, biomechanics and good movement with aesthetic goals uh like bodybuilding so any closing thoughts for today any anything that we didn't uh, get to cover that you wanted to kind of circle back to before we finish up today um not really like uh i know i probably sounded like i was shitting on science there is a lot of good coming out of the scientific field i'm just saying don't completely rely on it as a religious text you have to or you don't have to do anything but you should (laughs) test yourself Within your own body, use your intuition. In order to be a good mover, you're going to need to do this. And I think that really good movers will tell you that as well. Okay, so um, trust yourself, use your intuition, do your own observations, come to your own conclusions, use the science as a way to discern, uh, you know, the what is the body of evidence right now. And you can compare that to what you feel and how you move. Okay. So, um, that's the way I would use it. I do yeah. still look at, uh, papers and I look at them with validity. A lot of them, I, I actually go to the methods and results usually first. Okay. So mm-hmm. if I see a method that's off and your, your method doesn't match the conclusion, then I'm going to be suspicious. And that happens a lot by the way. Okay. So that's a topic for another discussion. Um, yeah, that was, that was a great episode. Yeah, I liked it. And uh, I, that's, that's, you know, guys, you're never going to learn what the taste of wine is by reading about wine. You got you to gotta drink it. And you're never going to learn about what good efficient movement is just by listening to a podcast about efficient movement. So go and move and practice and test these things yourself. Thanks for listening to The Art of Move, guys. This is episode 24. Episode 25 is tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. And uh, we'll see you next time. Nofilter.net. Have a good one, guys.